you seem to take an awful lot of care uh, in the type of pictures you have taken and the way you present yourselves in the media. <coughs> How do you go about controlling it? Or what, what do you aim for in terms of an image? Uh, is it that much different from yourselves and the real selves? No, it's exactly the same, really. The only, the only difference from the image that we have on uh, paper and, and the real thing is that... Uh, when we have the pictures taken, we make sure we're looking our best, as it were, and we <laughs> obviously don't 24 hours a day. But um, clothes-wise and the type of image, it's not really that different at all. We've always just worn in photo sessions the clothes that we're wearing at the time. We're very, we're very insistent about the quality uh, of uh, pictures that go out, and uh, generally <coughs> things that we can have control over. We make sure we have uh, as much as possible. You know, we insist on, that we see photos that we choose the photos that come out. It's really the only way you can ensure that you get you know quality every time. Because if you leave it up to someone else, mm. they they won't have the same idea mm. of uh, as you all have. So it, invariably, you know, <coughs> you feel that it's not up to scratch. So it's always best. It saves a lot of aggravation for everyone. Thank you. So, it was quite, quite simple, really. I mean. You know, it's not pleasant to have a nasty picture of yourself in uh, a million copies of whatever. Is there anything you can't control? Oh, there are lots of things we can't control. Like, uh, live photography, things like that. And there, there are various, various things that you can't control, but you just make sure that you have enough good photographs uh, available so people want to use the good ones. Hmm. Hmm. I think you just answered this question, but just for the purpose of the interview. Uh, he wants to know what you use as criteria uh, to judge which photograph make it out. Mm, <laughs> Any sort of one basis uh, that d determines like the type of pictures, the type of photographs you release? Um, Mostly. We're not, we're not really that concerned about a concise image. We're just trying to look attractive in the photographs. Yeah, you know, but you know, one, the ones that uh, <coughs> really is... Uh, glamorous to the extent uh, that we we look really good in them. Um, we don't we don't concentrate on the picture, uh, the um, the situation that we're in. It's, it's you know our faces. And if we look good, you know that's there are two photo. types. There's one type which is like a, a glamorous photo, which obviously we like, and there's another type which basically show is a warm photo. Have you got a if, the, if there's a picture where we both look very natural and we look, uh, <coughs> you know, if we're both nice natural smiles or whatever. Yeah, and you can sort look of smiling yeah. photos and sort yeah. of... Yeah, but, some, but smiling photos come in posed and natural ones, you know, and uh, if they're good and they, if they make, if they're attractive smiles or if they're, you know, we don't really think about it that much, but you know a good, good photo because the smile is genuine. Mm -hmm. so uh, the question relating to your first album, you did a cover of uh, Love, Love, Machine. Love Machine, and he was just wondering, uh, being apparently avid rhythm R&B fans, uh, would it be conceivable for you guys to do an album like Bowie's Pinups Pin in the future, where you do a, a album of nothing but covers? And if you did, what songs would you do? No, I don't. I don't think we do a whole album. I don't know. I've thought about that before. I thought it'd be quite not, nice. not, not for it'd be a long time. It would be a long time. Oh no, it's warm. I think it'd be quite a good idea. But in about yeah. four or five yeah. albums time, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one that I mean uh, it does I mean mood doesn't take us right now, but no. it's, it's, it's just that there are so many songs that sound like they'd be great to cover. Hmm. Yeah. Like what for example? Oh there's hundreds. Yeah. There's we, two we, that we like a lot. There's a, an Aztec camera song and there's a um teardrop explodes so much you might actually do on the next album but I mean it's the kind of thing that's nice to do you know I mean, it's just self-indulgence mm -hmm. um, the only thing about it is that you have to do you have to be convinced that your versions of uh, of um, each track are as good as the originals which is not likely to happen hmm. so I mean uh, it would be quite a long time before we, before we approached anything it was vaguely like that, but I don't know. I mean, I think we have too much material of our own to put out. Hmm. Have you done anything at stage or rehearsals? That are, any covers uh, during rehearsals or on stage that you've never decided to put on the vinyl? 
Uh, no, we do we do uh, we do good times in the live show, but we wouldn't put it on an album. Good times. We do good times yeah, by Sheik. By Sheik. Good times by Sheik, and we do it very close to the original. Uh, so we wouldn't want to do that, you know, on an album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Apart from anything, that's the type of track that you wouldn't even try to make better. Hmm. Hmm. He's, got, he's pushing the point a bit here, but if you were to like, if you were to be forced into making a a record like that, what songs would you choose, just out of curiosity? Well, a whole album. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, not offhand. We can, we can give you a few, like what like George said. There's a, a teardrop track we'd like to cover, and then take a can a track. Um, some some older, perhaps some older Motown stuff. Maybe maybe some Captain Velvet Jungle. There's a lot of well, stuff, really. Well, they, you know, it, it's, it's it would be better to take <coughs> tracks that were not very well known that we like. Mm-hmm. Uh, trouble is, there aren't that many of those because we we <laughs> listen to mainly top forty. Yeah, it, it's it's really good to, in a way that if you cover a track that is a great song that hasn't been, you know, widely heard, it's nice to be able to give it that sort of exposure. Hmm. Apart from anything, it doesn't get compared as much hmm. to the original. Hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't actually think it's a viable idea. It's a nice idea, but I don't suppose we'd ever do it. Hmm. Hmm. We might do one more, you know. We'll probably do one... An EP, that would be an idea. Hmm. Do an EP. An EP <coughs> of covers. Four or five. Hmm. The, the quality of the recording of the first album was surprisingly good uh, for a couple of guys who just made their first album. Where did you learn, uh, or where did you master the art of uh, studio techniques? Well, it's, it's not. It's down to us, and it's down. It's down to the producer and uh, the engineer. But we, I mean, if you have a definite idea of, we've been listening to records since we were God knows how old. So you know, you do get an ear for what sounds really good. And if if um, if the uh, engineer is setting up sounds or whatever, you know, you can, you can hear a good sound. So basically, it's from from experience. With this, I think record. why I think the reason p- people. I think what surprises people in the, is the overall professionalism of the record and the fact that we arranged them. Um, and I think the most professional thing compared to a lot of other de- debut arrangements is just that, the arrangement. Uh, and that basically just comes from listening to thousands and thousands of pop records hmm. over, what, 15 years. And uh, you, you develop, like... Um, a sense of uh, what is, is exactly right rhythmically and uh, melodically uh, well at least we have and uh, that that is the major difference I think hmm. though I mean when you start up from zero what do you do well how do you write a song well I would imagine the melody comes into your head and then you say how about this and then you both work on it how does this arrangement start you say you want to Guitar here, you want two guitars and a rhythm track and a keyboard track on this song? Well, arrangement, I mean, when you're talking about arrangement, you're really talking about um, the things that you do which embellish the track. Embellish the track, mm-hmm. yeah. And you, you, start with about you start with the basic uh, background of, uh, mm-hmm. of music. You're talking, uh, about the way, you're talking about the way that um, rhythms complement each other from different instruments and harmonies mm-hmm. and things like that. <coughs> and that, I mean, it'd be too far, far too too difficult to explain because I mean it's, it happens in so many different ways. Uh, but if you know, if you have that ex, if you have that sense, you know when it, that there's more arrangement to be done, mm. or you know when you put too much into a track, mm. either rhythmically or melodically. And it just, you know, it's not something that you actually mm. think about too much because it is something that you're you're used to. Mm. Did it take a lot of time to find the sound you were looking for in the studio? Or did it basically come pretty easily to the able uh, No, it didn't come easily. I mean, the whole album didn't come easily because we were under a lot of pressure and uh, because <coughs> I wrote the remaining tracks on the album that had to, do, had to be written mm-hmm. uh, while we were in the studio. And um, it, it was quite difficult, but uh, sound-wise, we just wanted to try and get various sounds within the album mm. which I think we su- succeeded in doing I really need a tissue <laughs> <laughs> I, 
but obviously the sound doesn't vary <coughs> hugely because we use the same, you know, we co-produced with Steve Brown and uh, his sound and the engineer we used have various similarities. The next album will be producing, well, I'll be producing myself. So um, hopefully, because I have no no former experience of production on my own, I'll be able to uh, vary the sounds a lot more from track to track. Mm -hmm. So probably uh, encountered with this one a lot, but you attained this much uh, success the first album, and you must be uh, somewhat pressured into following up uh, that same success with the second album. Do you have any concrete ideas of what the second album is going to be like at this point? Not yet. Well, we've got, we've got some basic guidelines of how we'd like it to sound, what sort of album we'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think the, ba the only real, um, the real concrete idea is that having shown that we can fuse uh, the two styles being black music and white pop, you know, soul and pop uh, on, on the singles and again on the album. Th having shown we confuse them, that we'd like to pull them apart a little bit and uh, be a little more adventurous with the um, the black sounding stuff uh, and make hard funk tracks, but also come further away from the idea which has been very credible in our country for the last couple of years of, of fusing those styles mm. and uh, get down to writing some, some pop songs which I mean the, 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 they're all pop songs obviously but I think we want to push the two styles a little bit further into mm. their own categories so that we can uh, actually achieve more feel with each record because I think fusion between the two styles although it's very commercial and obviously there's a lot to be said for it it does limit um, the feel of a pop record and the feel of a black record it kind of dilutes the two a bit so we'd like to, to harden them both hmm, hmm. you know this isn't there there's uh, uh, um, in making the second album yeah. <coughs> no, there's no. I, I'm actually very, very confident about it because um, we were. But when we made the first album, uh, that pressure was mainly due to the fact that we were doing everything ourselves. We had no management, um, and uh, just basically the first six months of um, fame, as it were, it were beginning to take their toll, and. That pressure made the album very hard to make. We're not under that pressure now, hmm. and uh, we feel a lot mentally. We feel a lot better. Hmm. So, um, I think the next album should be a lot more relaxed, and being more relaxed, it should be a lot better. Hmm. Are you confident of anything? What do you have confidence in for the second album? Well, we have confidence in sales. Really? <laughs> yeah, I think we've got a very sturdy following at home now. We've, went, we've been out and toured and we've done a very successful tour, probably the most successful tour of this year mm. or the last couple of years from the new band. Um, and uh, so we've got we've got that following behind us. And also, by the time the next album is out, I think uh, there'll be another couple of hit singles. Mm. Mm. I have a solo single which will probably come out within the next few months, mm. uh, which will also widen our audience a lot. Mm. Because whether people see it as solo or not, they're still going to see the connection with Wham. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so Club seem to have been able to uh, repeat their success uh, rather well with the second album. <coughs> well, they've done a lot. Well, they've never been the like, first album. The first, no, album, the first album was really naff <laughs> was compared made? to. Well, it was really not very good at all mm -hmm. compared to. Uh, Do you really want to hurt me in time? Mm -hmm. It really wasn't any good, but uh, the second album is is great. It's a very good album. I feel like I'm quite young, but despite the quality of your music, uh, you seem to be attracting a audience that's largely female and largely young. And so often, in cases like this, the music becomes over gets overlooked. Uh, do you ever feel any sort of uh, dissatisfactions over this? Uh, 
type of following or this type of, a, of uh, recognition? No, because there's a, there's a large proportion of the audience that uh, doesn't overlook the music. We don't, I mean, <coughs> we've just toured and we were surprised by the amount of uh, boys in the audience. It was definitely 50-50. Yeah, and they're, they're attracted just as much to the image as, in a way, as the girls are, mm -hmm. but they appreciate the music that much more because they're uh, one step removed from the image. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So, um, but uh, critically, it doesn't bother us at all. I mean, we, we, uh, we, I mean, uh, we, we know, we know basically that we're not going to be taken seriously. We were very, originally we were taken very seriously, too seriously by the press in our country, and uh, became like they tried to make us like social spokesmen. Hmm. And the minute it occurred to. Uh, them that girls had started screaming at us because they didn't didn't really notice us that much as in the very beginning, but quite soon um, afterwards when the marketing started, mm. you know, the faces became more important. And um, the minute that people started screaming at us, they so suddenly realised that uh, perhaps we weren't social spokesmen at all. And because we we threw off that tag ourselves anyway. They saw it as uh, us saying we don't want to be social spokesmen because we'd much rather get screamed at, which wasn't what we were saying at all. All we were saying was we don't like the responsibility that you're putting on us, you know, hmm. and uh, expecting from our lyrics hmm. by saying we're, well, you know, spokesmen for our generation, etc. Hmm. Um, <coughs> and uh, they, the, the press almost, uh, the, the, at least the rock press, as you call them, almost, almost invariably now slag us off you know hmm. and we won't be taken seriously for a good while yet but who cares I mean we know that that doesn't matter to us hmm. I mean we're not going to make the mistake that some some groups have done this year hmm. and made uh, follow up albums to huge successes hmm. but which have taken a much more serious and less commercial uh, direction hmm. and will undoubtedly sell minute proportions of what they sold last year and their following it will diminish as well. You know, we're not under that threat. We know exactly what we're doing. We know we play commercial music, mm. but it's also very good commercial music. And uh, we know what follow following we'll have mm. for the next couple of years. But we also know the music is going to co co um, cover us when that following dies down, because these teeny bopper things always do after four or five years. Mm. What are you slagged off for, for the most part? Um, well, they slag us off for things. Uh, they, they basically um, try to make out that we are manipulated cool. and uh, cool. that we have become, you know, a marketed uh, product and that we have no actual talent ourselves. They try to take <coughs> all the credit of, mm. uh, of the stage show that we've just done and the tour that we've done. Mm. They were very, in very, I mean, they couldn't actually think of who, who had actually done it mm. or, or they couldn't say and be sure who'd done it so they, mm. but they tried to make out that we weren't responsible for the success that we were creating and for the reactions that we created um, as though we were just told what to do and we got up on stage and, and did the right things and made the girls scream and made the boys laugh and you know mm. uh, but we knew exactly what we're doing we know what we're doing mm. we've, we've got no one telling us what to do in a creative sense at all but um, they can't accept that because that would that would mean that we're being very clever uh, at the same time as being very commercial. Hmm. Hmm. Why did the oh, just for a moment, please. The press label you as a social spokesman uh, for in the first uh, stages. Simply because the first single we released in England was Wham Rap, mm -hmm. and that was about unemployment, and uh, they loved that. Uh, and then because we, we released um, a record which said, which told kids not to get married early, you know, and it, that was that was Young Guns. And there were two, there were two things that we wrote about because we felt we, that, that they were good to write about. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they weren't because we wanted to become spokesmen. Mm. And uh, the other material just isn't like that. Because mm. there are only a certain number of things that we have to say mm. which relate to our our 
generation that haven't been said before, and mm. we don't want to go around saying things that have been said before. Mm. I don't know. So, Jibunta said may be uh, mistaken if he is. He wants you to correct him, <coughs> correct him but he's under the impression that uh, kids in Britain, the UK, tend to go through a stage where they do rather uh, things that would be considered uh, somewhat radical or somewhat out of the ordinary by, say, kids in Japan, and then they go on to become uh, basically proper uh, members of society. Uh, do most of the kids in Britain go through this sort of stage? No, not most. No, not mm-hmm. most. Obviously, more than Japanese. Mm-hmm. All, ba- all you're basically saying is that uh, British kids experiment more when they when they're um, young, and they have a a less uh, concrete picture of what they want to grow up into. Mm-hmm. I think Japanese um, children, if they don't do that, it probably means that they are um, they have they know what they're going to become. <coughs> You know, whilst they're teenagers, I don't know. I don't know which is the best. I would actually prefer. I actually prefer the idea that, that people experiment when they're young. Mm. Um, but all it means is that people are growing up. It doesn't mean that they doesn't mean that they conform or they're they're beaten down by society or anything. It just means that they grow up and decide that they don't necessarily need to be anything different. Mm. Mm. Be happy. Rebellion mm. or. Uh, when you felt like rebelling and wouldn't listen to what people or society was saying and just yeah. branched off on your own? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, about 16. What were you doing? <laughs> like what? Nothing that I care to mention, really. <laughs> we couldn't have been eating that bad. Just the usual. The usual? I didn't, I never wanted to. Yeah. Really? <laughs> no, he, I mean, he didn't for very long. Mm-hmm. For a while, it's just a matter of the company you keep usually, mm-hmm. and uh, he kept a different company for a while to me, mm. and therefore went through a different phase. But um, it's not just to do that. Oh, it was my, mainly to do that. Ninety percent. That's what I think. Anyway. But the, but the uh, I've never agreed with that for a start. I've never agreed with that theory that it's, it's just the company you keep. Well, what, how, what do you put it down to? Because then? I I put it down to there's a seed anyway. Seed of rebellion. See, only last six months, didn't it? It's not for last week, no, it doesn't. <sighs> well, anyway, mm. but anyway, I mean, I'm, I never get bored with anything. Mm. Mm. Um, I don't know why. I just had an idea that I mean, I, I was just, I was just going through. It was just that I, I just felt I was going through uh, my teenage. <clears throat> Uh, years like the end of education and everything just kind of doing time until I knew what until I knew exactly how I wanted to become a pop star because I knew I was become a pop star I was just very stupid to have um, realised that I couldn't that I uh, could have branched out a bit earlier I left school at 18 and I wish I'd left school at 16 hmm. I mean I, I don't actually think I learned anything at school from the age of about 14 because um, I'd learned everything I needed to know Mm. To, be, to do what I wanted to do mm. and the rest of the time was just wasted <coughs> mm. um, but uh, I didn't realise that at the time so it was too late I mean it hasn't done me any harm I just think that <coughs> it's two years of my life that I could have, ins- I could have spent enjoying myself as opposed to uh, being bored mm. well you were quite subdued whereas you were bored and a little more restless then yeah when I, yeah what did you do yeah, about 16. Just totally discontented with most things. And uh, reacted. <laughs> Just uh, basically went off on your own. And I don't think that you reacted particularly, did you? No, let's not, let's not try and make ourselves out to be a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reacted. Hmm. Well, I just think that it's, it's an interesting thing because a lot of the kids here who listen to your music are probably about that age. Uh, at least that's one large segment, and they're probably just interested in knowing what you went through as well. Cause it seems we all go through that stage about the age of 15 or 16, right when we start the field, we're becoming adults. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, kids, <coughs> kids will go through their own personal versions of that. 
you know, it's no use giving advice because there's no advice you can give. I don't think anyone's got any answers to that. Mm -hmm. If they had, the psychiatrist would be out of work, you know. So mm. I can't really give any answers mm. to that. <coughs> that makes sense. And that's all that. You see a lot of the younger uh, British bands these days kind of uh, producing a sound that seems to be based on rhythm and blue, rhythm and blues. Uh, one example I might cite is uh, Paul Weller's Style Council. He seems to be presenting the r r rhythm and blues bass in a somewhat different manner than you. Uh, how do you ev evaluate his uh, efforts if you listen to that at all? Mm. Um, I think. I'm for a start, I don't really understand when you say rhythm and blues because rhythm and blues over in, in England means the sort of um, James Brown. <laughs> uh, no, not, no, not James Brown. He, he's more funk. That's funk uh -huh. and soul. Rhythm and blues is uh, Doctor Feelgood. Hmm. Um, hmm. The, the blues end, right, blues right, and right, rock. Right, yeah, right. sort of fusion of blues and rock. Uh, yeah, over in how we understand the, you, you blues. I mean, the American, the American um, interpretation of it is. M Incorporates most dance music really, mm -hmm. uh, where it doesn't doesn't really in England. It's always had quite a vague, uh, a vague um, term in England. Hmm. Well, let's put it this way: then black music. Yeah. It seems that a lot of yeah. the sounds are based on black music, and one being the Style Council, which is very solo. -like. I think um, I think Paul Weller left the jam. Basically, since he's left the jam, he's written some really good songs. Uh, <clears throat> but he's basically trying to imitate various styles, which is obviously what he wants to do. I mean, you couldn't, uh, the, you know, there's the um, there's the like stack sound that he's mm -hmm. gone for, and then he's gone for the uh, uh, like a very hard, like a New York funk sound mm -hmm. with money go around and then there's the uh, obvious soul synth bass type right. soul record with uh, what was it Long Hot Summer right. so I mean he's done he's done basically very he's imitated in a much stricter fashion than we have hmm. I think we've just taken bits from everywhere mm -hmm. and bung them into ours um, I would, I'd not, not say that's any better or worse I just think it's uh, mm -hmm. It's become more obvious. Not don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but you got like bands like Roman Holiday and Joe Boxers as well. Um, how about these bands? I don't really take much of a liking to either. Oh really? Why is it? Uh, I just don't like. Um, I, I love the two. I suppose I prefer Roman Holiday. Mm. They seem less pretentious. Joe Fox has uh, mm -hmm. got some decent songs to sing about their attitude and, and the way they're very obviously have a very strong attitude to their music. Mm. Although that's uh, that's good, mm -hmm. um, it just uh, detracts from the record somehow. I, I like nothing about their image. Their image is, is uh, a totally false image. You, you won't see. Uh, there's absolutely no kids like, like Joe Boxers. They have a totally false attitude and perspective hmm. uh, that they project with their music. Um, it, may, it may not be their own personal attitude and mm -hmm. perspectives, but the one they actually project is, uh, is it doesn't... Um, it's very macho, it's a very working class macho. Yeah, but I think mm. it's not even working class. Mm. Uh, it's working class maybe, well, the style for start their visual image is, is actually nothing, in no way related to anything today. Mm. No, it's American, isn't it? It's American, it's, it's from D, it's, it's mm. American working class. Well, exactly, it's not related to anything today. I'm, I mean, not, I'm not sure, American. I mean, they, even kids in record don't look like that, anything like no, that. Sure today. Yeah. But uh, I think. I think um, I wrote one of their songs uh, that was just got like I thought that was actually brilliant. Mm -hmm. It was a, like um, it was a really good pop single. It had real energy. But so much uh, different from the other songs, though. So yeah. it's so much different from the other songs. It's something I've never quite been able to put um, my finger on. I really no, no, it's, it's like Boxer Beat. It's much better than Boxer Beat. Boxer mm. Beat had an awfully uh, 
twee mm. melody. Uh, but um, Just Got Lucky is really good. But I didn't like um, that Johnny Fenley. Mm. Mm. It, it seems like they're not serious. It seems like they're very camp about it, about that whole image. Oh, I know. They're pretty serious no, about no, it. Mm. Really? It seems like they're sort of 1940s dead end kids type of. They're very mm. serious about it. Really? Yeah. Hmm. How about Roman Holiday then? Roman Holiday, I, I think um, I think they're on to a bit of a loser because they're they're about the third or fourth band in the last two or three years who've tried to bring swing hmm. back into the charts. At least in our country, no one's interested. Hmm. Um, there's a big underground. Um, <laughs> it's not exactly underground. Um, sort of a cult of fifties uh, rockabilly. Uh, uh, that sort of uh, New York, J- the Jets and the Sharks and Jets, that that sort of image, and Roman Holiday uh, have sort of taken that out of the, uh, which is what is very much a club situation, and try and try to make it commercial. But it, it doesn't work. Well, the rockabillies are. Um, well, the rockabillies are I mean, the uh, the, the rockabilly um, dresses. They've are taken the, it out and watered it down. Yeah, to make it more commercial, mm. more like. Uh, West Side Story, but it's, it's never, I don't think you, you can ever take that sort of mentality. Mm. There's mentality. something about swing which uh, just doesn't appeal to people, uh, that hasn't appealed to people for years, you know, mm. as, a, as a general thing. You see, the, the image, the uh, that image in the clubs, they don't listen to swing, they listen to funk. Yeah, mm. the, the rockabilly so now listen to soul, mm. you know, so uh, there's not really... Um, I think they just did it because they wanted something to go with the music, or personally, I think they liked swing, and they'd like to do something different than the charts, but people just don't seem to want to know it. And they've got perfectly good commercial songs, but hmm. swing just seems, seems to turn people off. You know, it's funny, you, when a band achieves success, often they sort of close themselves off from what's happening, the new stuff, and kind of drop into their own world. It seems like you two are both very familiar with everything that's happening. No, I, I still go. I still go to all the clubs where um, where those people go, where all the rockabillys go, mm-hmm. and so on, things like. Mm-hmm. That. Andrew doesn't so much of it because he doesn't like it. Mm-hmm. There's nothing. Nothing's changed in those clubs for a year. <laughs> you know, I mean, the comment that I've made now about clubs is exactly the same. Well, nearly exactly the same as it was eight months ago to a year. They haven't changed. There's nothing new in the clubs, and it's unexciting. That's why I don't go. <laughs> I go for exactly the same reasons I went before to get drunk and listen to the occasional good record. Well, actually, some of the clubs you go to, you know, you can listen to loads of great records. Mm. Bernie, some of them. Uh, but it is definitely very boring to see. Mm. Mm. And you've achieved great success in both the UK and Japan. It seems like the only major market left is America. Are you confident in selling records there? Yeah, I mean, we've got Europe as well, but Mm -hmm. um, America is the only one we haven't got. And we're confident of that because the only reason we haven't got America is lack of uh, record company uh, Mm. action. It's not that people don't like it, because everywhere where we get played, we we sell records. Mm. Uh, The two areas we've been playing most, New York and uh, and, uh, Los Angeles. We've done really well. I mean, LA, we we got to number four, I think. Well, it's really only been it's really only been California, not New York. We haven't sold records in New York. San Francisco, all of California, we've been Is that right? pretty successful. We had number one in in, uh, in San Francisco on some either radio station or a local chart mm. on the gay chart. <laughs> I thought it was a number one, as in uh, a proper. I thought it was the area of sales. No, I think it. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't actually. be at all surprised. No, I be surprised, but I think it was. I think it was the gay. Basically, act. because it was the gay charts. Well, that's what I mean. San Francisco is basically gay, isn't it? Seventy percent. We had le- leather jackets on and on the cover of Bad Boys. Mm. Uh, it's not something they relate to. It's about seventy, Andrew. I promise you. Nah. Honestly, you look it up. Yeah, anyway, uh, that that's. Uh, that was why we were very successful there. I think it was just the jackets on the cover. What about uh, c- critical response in the America? <coughs> How's it been? Uh, all, of, all I've read is one really bad review in uh, Rolling Stone. Uh-huh. Um, one of the worst reviews we had on the album was in Rolling Stone because all the reviews we got over. In, in, uh, we haven't really read anything but the English ones. And the, uh, the English ones, even though they, they were very grudging, 
because they'd already realised that you know we were a scream band. They just still had to admit that we made um, a really good pop album. Hmm. Hmm. And it's just become what? What is it? It's the it's the number one album of the year, isn't yeah. it? On on chart positions. Is it really? On sales, yeah. yeah. Wow. Not on sales, on on chart positions, on points. You know, you get a certain amount of points from number one. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. This is good. Wow, that is. Ah. And it got the most popular magazine in uh, in England, which is Smash Hits. Is that uh, the most popular magazine? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah, Smash oh. Hits is half a million circulation, nearly. Is that right? Yeah. Uh huh. All we ever get here, all we ever get here, sounds and melody maker and. No, oh, no, those, those are very low circulation. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Is that right? <coughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's really? why they. Uh, that's why, with the exception of Melly Maker, who hate the hate the screen bands, but still use them to sell. Smash it sells a lot all over Europe. Uh huh. It's really, really big. Is it more of a positive? Now all these other ones are so negative. Uh, uh, it's Smash it's it's very well, it's well, it's well, Smash it's is turning around a little bit because there's a new magazine in England which is selling in proportion nearly as much because it's twice as regular it's every week mm -hmm. and Smash It's is every two weeks what's this other one you're talking yeah, about? yeah number, number one mm -hmm. and we're like number one's best no, band number one's week. number one huh. we're like in, they were in there every week just about a poster or a, you know and but um, I mean that's due that's, that's solely due that's not because number one have decided to champion us Simply because they have so much feedback from their fans, they have a readers' chart, they have readers this, readers that, and like Club Tropicana was um, stayed in the readers' chart for the longest. Out of, I mean, Beat Culture Club, so you know they're they're just really reflecting what their readers want to see, <laughs> which is our pictures and Smash Hits. <laughs> Um, Smash Hits, even though they're, they're Smash Hits haven't really paid an awful lot of attention to us this year, maybe because number one have taken so much. Mm. But uh, Smash Hits uh, readers voted fantastic um, the album of the year. Smash above the Culture Club one, yeah. even though mm. above the Culture Club album and the Dur no, and the Duran Duran album, even though those two bands came ahead of us in the best group category. Mm. Smash Hits, the tone of Smash Hits is, is becoming far more um, rock rather like the enemy, they're drifting sort of left field because number one seems to be, uh, you know, is barging on their territory, they're moving over and it, it's, it shows there's, it's, they don't really reflect their, um, the, the majority of their readership uh, because uh, we, we got the number one album but the, their uh, attitude towards us is very, very uh, lukewarm. Hmm. Um, hmm. We had a really bad review. The only, the only bad review in the sort of uh, glossy tabloid music magazine, which record the uh, number one, um, of, of our tour, mm -hmm. the concert, you know. And like, we had absolutely the, shiny the majority, reviews yeah, from the others. The majority you know. of the people who come and see us also read Smash Hits. Mm -hmm. And you ask any of the, any of the kids for what they thought about the show. And it was it's totally the opposite to what they said. It's no shit. So they 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 aren't reflected. It's definitely. I mean, it's definitely. Uh, we're a little bit of a um, a problem for for the uh, English music press because we do. You know, we have made a very very good record, a very popular record, um, and it has a little more. There's a little more um, polish to it and a little more. Uh, <coughs> Intelligence than, than a lot of the, the bands that are getting screamed at, mm -hmm. and they don't know quite how to take it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think they don't know whether to actually credit us with anything or whether to just uh, say let's forget about them until the screaming dies down. You know, but we know that they'll have to come round in the end because, mm -hmm. uh, like every other establishment, you know, they come round when when success is huge for long enough. They um, they have to come round because mm. everyone is telling them they don't care what they say. So. Who cares? <laughs> 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 ah, more to say. The interview. Now, the record of the one is just because one thing is that we have a lot of. Ah, so the whole show is called. We have a an <laughs> radio station here, a lot like the BBC. It's called the NHK, government run, <laughs> and on it is a rock program which I'm a part of and I do with the editor of this magazine and we have a uh, a yearly uh, vote from listeners 
and like they have three categories, one of which is what we call the brightest hope, in other words, the best new band. And so far, in the voting, which will end in another couple of weeks, WAM has pretty much secured a position, at least first, second, or third, uh, in that uh, category. And so it looks like you guys might walk away with the first uh, first place there. So what we want is a message here mm. for the listeners. In case we do. Which, well, looks pretty likely. Believe it or not, this is welcome professional. can be used for uh, its radio quality. It's just good sounds, so we're just going to get mm. the taping done right here. Okay. Just from here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can have a couple seconds to so think about it. So this is on the presumption that we've, that we've, we've come first here. Yeah. We so, uh, it's it's not that you Huh? It's already almost said that yeah, you're going to be number one. Let's just thank the support, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that sounds good. Also, saying your own names. Yeah, okay, yeah. fine. Hello, this is George. And this is Andrew. We'd just like to say thank you very much for everyone for your support and... Uh, we are bright. And what, what was, it, was it? Brightest hope. Yeah. Brightest hope. Yeah. Do it again. Do it again. Hello, this is Andrew. Hello, this is George from Wham. We'd like to thank everyone for your support in 1983. Um, we know we came pretty high on your brightest hopes. We think that uh, 94, 1984 is going to be a really good year for us, and we hope for your continued support. Do you want to do that one again? No, 94. <laughs> that's not fine. That's not fine. That's fine. All right, leave it there. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. It's a take. It's a take. 1994. <laughs> 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 All right, that's a lot. I'm going to fall with three. Yeah. Oh, there's something. You seem to take an awful lot of care uh, in the type of pictures you have taken and the way you present yourselves in the media. <coughs> How do you go about controlling it? Or what, what do you pay for in terms of an image? Uh, is it that much different from yourselves and the real selves? No, it's exactly the same, really. The only, the only difference from the image that we have on uh, paper and, and the real thing is that... Uh, when we have the pictures taken, we make sure we're looking our best, as it were, and we <laughs> obviously don't 24 hours a day. But um, uh, clothes-wise and the type of image, it's not really that different at all. We've always just worn in photo sessions the clothes that we're wearing at the time. We're very, we're very insistent about the quality uh, of uh, pictures that go out, and uh, generally <coughs> things that we can have control over. We make sure we have that as much as possible. You know, we insist on, that we see photos, that we choose the photos that go out. It's really the only way you can ensure that you get, you know, quality every time. Because if you leave it up to someone else, mm. they they won't have the same idea mm. of uh, as you'll have. So it, invariably, you know, <coughs> you know, it's not up to scratch. So it's always best to save a lot of aggravation for everyone. Thank you. So it was quite quite simple, really. I mean. You know, it's not pleasant to have a nasty picture of yourself in uh, a million copies of whatever. Is there anything you can't control? Oh, there are lots of things we can't control. Like, uh, live photography, things like that. And there, there are very various things that you can't control, but you just make sure that you have enough good photographs uh, available so people want to use the good ones. Mm -hmm. So I think you just asked this question, but just for the purpose of the interview. Uh, he wants to know what you use as criteria uh, to judge which photograph make it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any sort of one basis uh, that d determines like the type of pictures, the type of photographs you release? Um, well, mostly, we're not, we're not really that concerned about a concise image. We're just trying to look attractive in the photographs. Yeah. You know, but perfectly. Yeah. R&B fans, uh, would it be conceivable for you guys to do an album like Bowie's Pinups pin in the future where you do a, a album of nothing but covers and if you did what songs would you do? No, I don't, I don't think we do a whole album. I don't know, I've thought about that before. 
not for it'd be a long time. It would be a long time. Oh no, it's worm. I think it'd be quite a good idea. But in about four or five yeah. albums' time, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wonder. I mean, it does. I mean, mood doesn't take us right now. But no, it's, it's just that there are so many good. songs that sound like they'd be great to cover. Hmm. Yeah. Like what, for example? Oh, there's hundreds. Yeah. There's we, two we, that we like a lot. There's a, an Aztec camera song, and there's a um, teardrop explodes song, which you might actually do on the next album. But I mean, it's the kind of thing that's nice to do. You know, I mean, it's just self indulgence. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing about it is that you have to do. You have to be convinced that your versions of uh, of um, each track are as good as the originals, which is not likely to happen. Hmm. So I mean, uh, it would be quite a long time before we, before we approached anything that was vaguely like that. But I don't know. I mean, I think we have too much material of our own to put out. Hmm. Have you done anything at stage or rehearsals that uh, any covers uh, during rehearsals or on stage that you've never decided to put on the vinyl? Uh, no, we do we do uh, we do good times in the live show, but we wouldn't put it on an album. Good times. We do good times yeah, by chic. chic. Good times by chic, and we do it very close to the original. Uh, so we wouldn't want to do that, you know, on an album. Mm-hmm. Apart from anything, that's the type of track that you wouldn't even try to make better. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, he's pushing the point a bit here, but if you were to like, if you were to be forced into making a a record like that, what songs would you choose just out of curiosity? Well, a whole album? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, yeah. not offhand. We can, we can give you a few, like what George said, there's a, a teardrop track we'd like to cover, and then a take can a track. Um, some some older, perhaps some older Motown stuff, maybe, maybe some Captain Elton John track. <coughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff, well, really. Well, they, you know, it is. The ones, ones that are uh, really yes, uh, glamorous to the extent uh, that we we look really good in them. Um, we don't we don't concentrate on the picture, uh, the um, the situation that we're in. It's it's you know our faces. And if we look good, you know that's there are two photo. types. There's one type which is like a, a glamorous photo, which obviously we like, and there's another type which basically show is a warm photo. Have you got a if, the, if there's a picture where we both look very natural and we look, uh, <coughs> you know, if we're both nice natural smiles or whatever. Yeah, and you can it looks sort of genuine. Yeah. smiling photos and sort yeah. of... Yeah, but, some, but smiling photos come in posed and natural ones, you know, and uh, if they're good and they if they make, if they're attractive smiles or if they're, attra- you know, we don't really think about it that much, but you know a good, good photo because the smile is genuine. Mm-hmm. So I'll put it the question relating to your first album, you did a cover of uh, Love, Machine. Love, Love Machine, and he was just wondering, uh, being apparently avid rhythm 